Jeanette Winterson, you write some of the most excitingly written fictions of our day. The very first of them, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, in which a girl, a young woman called Jeanette, discovers she loves other women, had as great a success on BBC television as it did as a book. To what extent is Oranges autobiographical? I have very often been asked the question about Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit and its autobiographical content. And I have to say that when I was 24 and I was writing Oranges, I thought that as a northern working class girl, suddenly thrown into the big city, that I would find a sophistication and a culture which had perhaps otherwise been denied to me. So when I made myself into a fictional character, I did not believe that those critics and reviewers who seemed to me to be authority at that time would therefore assume that Oranges was autobiographical. I thought that they would be cleverer than that. It was a play on form in the same way that Virginia Woolf called Orlando a biography, in the same way that Gertrude Stein wrote, wrote the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, both saying, I'm telling you the truth, but with a large wink, both inviting intimacy, both offering confidences, but in a playful way, in a way which was from the very outset challenging a genre, a boxing in, a way of looking at the world. I thought I would do that with Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Uh, I wanted to challenge, and one way of challenging was not just to talk about lesbianism or the fear as well as the love that the church can inspire in people, but to play with the whole literary works. I am a literary writer, and I like to get my toolbox out and dismantle what already exists. So. There is a great game going on in Oranges, and some of it, of course, is based on experiences in my life, but that is true of every single book that has been written by anybody. You always use things that you know, but more importantly, you use the power of your imagination, you transform those experiences, and you invent other ones. And if you cannot remember, you must invent. And most of Oranges is invention, though, of course, I was brought up by Pentecostal parents in a working-class northern town. Uh, are there elements of autobiography in any other of your fictions? I have always used my own experience in my work, but it's true to say that there is probably more autobiography in Sex in the Cherry, uh, which is set in an invented historical past than perhaps there is in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. I want to knock down those walls. I don't want to tie myself in in any way. And so... Whenever I take a situation for my books, whether it's a historical situation or a contemporary situation, it is nevertheless an invention. That place does not exist. It never did exist. It's not authenticity. It's not realism. It's, it's a great game. It, it's a pretend because I think that the greatest truth is in the most feigning. And so I set up what is an entertainment, an enchanted place. Um, a forest which grows up overnight and then collapses the next day. You walk through it and you say, what was that place? Um, it is a fiction. I am a fiction writer. And I cannot stress too highly enough how important I think the role of the imagination is in literature. And I really have very little time for realism. If you want that, you can get it on the streets. Using your imagination, however, you write about passionate love between women in a way mm. that didn't used to be possible. I mean, when Radcliffe Hall wrote Well of Loneliness, and it was published in 1929, mm. and the nearest thing it contains to a description of lovemaking is, and in the night they were not divided, or something like that. And that yes. book was, 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 was prosecuted. Yes. Uh, it must be possible, it is possible, to write much more openly about women's love for women today than it was then. It is certainly possible, I think, for a writer to exercise greater moral freedom, greater freedom of choice in subject matter. But with any extension of freedom comes concomitant dangers and risks which also beset the writer. And when everything is possible, you must be very careful to make your own boundaries, to make your own limitations. Otherwise, chaos is everywhere. Um, we must have shapes, forms to our lives to make them significant. And it seems to me that a writer's job is to look into that chaos and make it shapely, make it coherent. So when I write about 
love between women, when I talk about passion, when I talk about sex, which I hope to do movingly and startlingly and shockingly, if need be. Nevertheless, um, I am my own judge, my own censor, which is better than having someone on the outside judging and censoring you. But you must still be it. You must be your own critic first and foremost. Is there such a thing as lesbian fiction? There is such a thing as lesbian fiction, and it's genre fiction, like science fiction, like crime writing, like thriller writing, and its scope is necessarily narrow. It must be, um, just as you have to have a body in a murder story, so you will have to have obligatory sex scenes, love scenes, in, in your lesbian books. And that's fine, they speak to a particular audience and they are necessary, um, but they are a kind of Mills and Boone. And I'm not interested in them, just as I wouldn't be interested in Mills and Boone or in that kind of very narrow writing. I want everything in my work. I don't want to say I'm only going to write about lesbians. I, I, I want the whole thing, the whole gamut, and I will have to draw it in, disciplined only by a lasso of words. In your most recent book, you say there is no such thing as autobiography. There is only art and lies. Yes. I said that partly as one of my challenges because I was so tired of people assuming that much of what I wrote or write is autobiographical because I think it's a way of limiting women's work, of trying to make it domestic and contained so that imagination is a male prerogative but women write about experience, they write about what they know, they write about their lives and of course this has been true, you know, the, the, the semi-myth of gentle Jane Austen sitting in the drawing room scribbling under her sampler what she saw going on around her. True and not true, it's more than that and it, I think although feminism has done so much work. I couldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for feminism. Nevertheless, we have to be careful not to concentrate too much on experience, but to recognise that there is something outside of that, which is spiritual, um, which is cerebral, which is intellectual, um, and which is purely to do with ideas and not to do with what I did today. Can I begin, however, by asking you about you, uh, and we'll come back to the writing. Could you tell us where you were born? Yes, I was born in Accrington, which is the place where the football team once came from and where Harrison Birtwistle comes from. And it's in Lancashire and it's a small mill town, uh, typical, cut out of the hills, uh, smoky, dark, but then suddenly into a rush of green space, into a rush of air, a rush of trees. And those two things, that tension is important to me. Who brought you up? I was brought up by my parents, my adopted parents, um, who took me from an orphanage in Manchester because they wanted a child that they could dedicate to God. Um, for my parents, religion was a vital thing, a muscular thing, an everyday thing, and God was not a remote being. God was on the doorstep. Uh, God was in the armchair, and if the larder was empty, God would fill it. So since neither of them, it seemed, could produce a child, they had to adopt one, and that was me. Did you have brothers and sisters? No, I had no brothers and sisters. I, um, my mother felt that she would prefer to concentrate on one. What was your mother like? Ah, Mrs. Winterson. Uh, my mother is dead now. She was a gargantuan figure. She was Rabelaisian in her dimension. She was biblical in her anger. She was too, too much for a small child, and so the small child had to, perhaps, begin to be like her in those dimensions. And some of my own feistiness and willingness to put up my fists and scrap, if I'm challenged, comes out of having to scrap with her, because if you didn't stand up for yourself in my household, um, you were finished. Did your father stand up for himself? Um, no, my father didn't stand up for himself. I think my father was born on his knees and he stayed on them throughout his married life, um, always in supplication either to my mother or to God. It didn't really make much difference and I don't know that he thought there was much difference. How religious was the relig religiousness of the household? It was religious but it, it was not conventional. Um, it was a household where miracles were expected and 
where indeed they happened. It was an Old Testament household. This is really the God of Moses. And you expect the God of Moses to be ever present, but also a God that loses his temper, a God that is difficult, um, a God that is irrational. All this played out um, through the large frame of my mother. The Bible, was that read? Yes, there were, there were six books in our house until I left and went to Oxford. And one of them was the Bible, another was Cruden's Concordance, so that we knew where to look things up in the Bible. Um, and it was necessary to read it before school, and for me at lunchtime as well, I had to take my own. And in the evening, the evenings were entirely given over to church activities. And the church was about five miles away. And uh, I think most of my health comes from the fact that I had to walk to school two miles there and two miles back into church, five miles there and five miles back every day. Was your childhood happy? Yes, my childhood was happy. I was a happy child, largely because I believe that I was special, chosen by God, that my relationship to the world was unique and that I had a place in it and that place was to change what I saw around me. And I think if a child has a strong framework, even if it's a difficult one, that is a help to the child. And if the child grows up in a loving atmosphere, no matter how bizarre, the child will be happy. I look back, I know it was bizarre, but to me, I thought everyone lived like that. Are you still in touch with Accrington or with your father? I'm not in touch with Accrington anymore. I don't think I can go back there now because it exists for me as an invented place. Partly because if you do use any of your own past, you, you write it out, you, you finish with it somehow, you, you, you make it into fiction and therefore it's accessible in a way which real life is not, but it's also closed in a way which real life is not. The Accrington that means something to me does not exist, so I'm not going to go and look at it. Um, and I do keep in touch with my father, yes, he's married again and he's happy. Um, did you ever meet your real mother? No, I never met my real mother. I often wondered about her, and I know that my parents knew who she was, but it was part of the fierceness with which I was guarded that that would not have been possible. You see, I was snatched out of the fire, as my mother saw it, out of the sin of the world, um, and redeemed to a better place. And she was absolutely determined that nothing, nothing, would come between me and my vocation. Well, it hasn't, but we just have a different idea of what that vocation was. When your adoptive parents, your father and mother, read uh, Oranges, what did they think of that? Did they think that uh, mm. that was uh, what they'd adopted you for? No. When Oranges was published, I hadn't seen my family for some time, um, many years, in fact. And when they read it, my mother wrote to me and she said, Oh, Jeanette, it was the first time I had to order a book in a false name. <laughs> And I did feel for her. Um, and she was torn, of course, with a mixture of absolute hatred and some understandable pride. But it wasn't possible for her to find a place to put that pride. Um, so we couldn't discuss what I was doing. We couldn't discuss what I had become. My father is now very proud of me. Now that Mrs. Winston is gone, he's able to say what he feels. How do you think, how do you, think you acquired your love of, your fascination with language? Well, my fascination with language comes straight out of the King James Version of the Bible. Um, I think there's no better book to be brought up on. And if you've only got six books in your house, let's pray that one of them is the Bible. Because those rhythms, that prose, it is a, a magnificent work of literature. I'm reading it through again now, though I'm not very far on. I'm only in with the prophets, but I'm fond of the prophets. Um, and I grew up hearing a language which was, which was both special and intimate, which was detached and had presence and had authority and yet spoke to me directly, just as it speaks to millions of people directly. And it is that, that wonderful tension which a writer seeks because writing literature, you know, it's lover's talk, it's whispers in the ear, but it's also a public declaration and that's what the Bible offers. After school, what did you do? <laughs> well, after school, it, it, it is true, I did work in a funeral parlour and I did have to make my living making ice cream and flogging it because uh, I needed money, I, I'd left what home. What did you do in the funeral parlour? Made up corpses. Um, I know it's an unusual job for a girl, but 
it was quiet and uh, I was able to get on with my own thoughts and the uh, alternative would have been to work in the pea canning factory and uh, I felt that that would be more of a hindrance to the contemplative life than making up dead bodies. A mental hospital? Yes, I did work in a mental hospital for a time, again, because I had nowhere to live and they offered me a place to stay, so I, I worked amongst the mad and I found them very companionable. I mean, they didn't interfere with the contemplative life either. What did you learn from that experience? When I was working in the mental hospital, I learned how quickly those who work among the damned, and I mean that because they are cut off from all those points of human comfort and, and sanity and love and warmth that are so necessary to us. I learned that people who work in that atmosphere become like it very, very quickly. It's terrifying. And, that, and in their steps, an inhumanity, which is very uncomfortable, very unpleasant. And there was much brutality in the mental hospital I worked in. I'm sure that there still is. And it is because people become cut off from those points of human sympathy, which is so necessary. You went to Oxford. Why Oxford? I went to Oxford because I had fallen in love with the idea of it because if you're a, a working class girl and you have to fight to get at books and you have to memorise uh, passages of poetry and literature that you love because you, you can't have the books and anyway books are rather suspect in your house if it's not the Bible, then the idea of somewhere um, which could be devoted to reading, which has a magnificent library, um, which is a place of learning um, and where when somebody knocks at the door you will not have to hide the book under the pillow and pretend you weren't reading it, seemed to me to be a charmed place, an enchanted place. And I thought, if I can just go there, it will be my talisman. I will get out of this. It will be rocket fuel to me. Um, and I will change my life. And that's what I did. I needed something large, a framework, uh, through which to, to push my energies so that I could break away from the smallness of what seemed to be around me. How did you start as a writer? Well, I suppose I started as a writer when I was very young because I always wrote sermons. I had enormous success as a preacher in my early youth and um, converted many souls. I don't know what's happened to them now. Um, and it seemed natural to me to try and to persuade people of my point of view, um, and to be declamatory, to be public, which is not usual for a girl. Um, it's not, it, it, it was that particular upbringing, I think, which allowed me to think, yes, um, my place in the world is a loud one. So I was prepared from the start to offer myself up as a target. And you have to do that if you're a writer because you'll always get knocked down. You have to have a lot of confidence. So I started to write Orange is Not the Only Fruit when I had no job when I was in London thinking, this is a, this is a complete mess. How did I get here? Um, I must amuse myself. So I did. Were you influenced by other writers? You've already mentioned Orlando. Mm. What about um, Angela Carter, say? No, I don't think Angela Carter is an influence because, in a way, part of the problem with being brought up as I was is that I have been influenced by things which are a lot older than my generation. And many of the things that were influencing her were also influencing me in parallel. The fact that she's older than me really wasn't a, a point. Um, Did you admire her? I do admire her, yes. I admire her work enormously. And I am sorry that she didn't get the kind of recognition that she should have got while she was alive. And I hope that that changes. Books like The Passion and Sexing the Cherry are... are feats of, of invention on a grand scale and sprawling across huge historical landscapes. What is it that draws you in your writing across the more conventional confines of time and space? I need to have a broad canvas. I like the large challenges. It's not enough for me to ever to try and speak about what I know, because what any of us know is so little. I want to speak about what I can imagine. And that's the challenge that I set myself in my work. Um, and when I was writing both The Passion and Sex in the Cherry, I wanted to create a place where people could come, which would be freed from the problems of gravity, where they would be outside of the confines of their daily life.